Hello everyone, I am Dr. Malavika MR, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Rama University, Kharagpur. Today I am before you to take a lecture on the topic Aminoglycoside Antibiotics. Aminoglycosides are available both as natural and semi-synthetic form. Today in this lecture we will deal about the classification, mechanism of action, antimicrobial spectrum, indication, dosing, pharmacokinetics and ADR and contraindication and precautions of aminoglycosides. Amino sugars are joined by glycosidic linkages, hence it named aminoglycosides. Here there is sugars, so these sugars make them water soluble. They are highly polar compounds. As it is water soluble, they are unlikely to be absorbed in the GI tract. So they are almost given as IV or IM root. This water solubility also make it unable to cross blood brain barrier and they also excrete unchanged in the urine. Now we shall move on to the antimicrobial spectrum. Aminoglycosides act on the gram positive bacilli and they do not act on gram negative as the gram negative bacilli have thicker cell wall and they do not act on anaerobes too because in their mechanism they need oxygen dependent transport to enter inside the cell. So they act on gram positive bacilli and aerobes. The aminoglycosides are broadly divided into systemic aminoglycosides and topical aminoglycosides. In systemic aminoglycosides, it consists of natural derivatives such as treptomycin, gindamycin, tobramycin, canamycin, and zizomycin. The synthetic derivatives are amikacin and ethylmycin. The topical agents are neomycin and fromycetin. Next, we shall move on to the mechanism of action of aminoglycoside. The mechanism is divided into two steps. First one is the transport of aminoglycoside through the bacterial cell wall and cytoplasm. And the next one is the binding of ribosome and inhibition of protein synthesis. Now let's have a look at the first session that is transport of aminoglycoside to, through the bacterial cell wall and cytoplasm. This is the cell wall of the bacteria and this is the periplasmic space and this is the cytoplasm. Aminoglycoside enters into the periplasmic space through the pouring channel and from here they are transported into cytoplasm by an oxygen dependent active process so that it's clear that only aerobes can pass into the cytoplasm. So after this when they reach the cytoplasm they bind into the ribosomal subunits. Streptomycin bind to the 30th ribosome. All other aminoglycosides some of them may bind to 50s some to 30s and some to the interface of 50 30s ribosomes as they bind to the ribosomal subunit they freeze the initiation of protein synthesis thus they prevent polysome formation and also promote desegregation into monosome that is ribosomal subunit they freeze the initiation of protein synthesis either by preventing polysome formation or by promoting desegregation into monosomes when the aminoglycoside bind to the 30th, 50th interface, then they cause distortion of mRNA codon recognition. Thus, there is a misreading of code. It causes faulty protein formation or no protein formation. So, this is the mechanism of action of aminoglycoside. Now, let's move on to the pharmacokinetics of aminoglycoside. Pharmacokinetics means what the body does to the drug. It consists of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And it's absorption of aminoglycoside. They are poorly absorbed in GIT as this is a highly polar drug. Therefore, they are given parenterally. That is 30 to 60 minutes IV infusion or IM injection. IM injection is rapid and complete. Now, moving on to distribution. Their distribution is restricted to ECF that is extracellular fluid as this is a polar drug. So their distribution volume approximately equal to the 20 to 25 percentage of body weight. They distribute well in the synovial fluid, peritoneum fluid, acytic fluid and pleural fluid. And a high concentration is obtained in the renal tissues. Their protein binding is less than 10 percentage. They are not metabolized in the body. So they are excreted unchanged in the urine via glomerular filtration. And their plasma T half is 2 to 4 hours. Next, we shall look on to the indications of aminoglycoside. Usually, they are used to treat the infections of abdomen and urinary tract. 
and they are used to treat bacteremia, endocarditis, preventing and treating of respiratory tract infections, meningitis and tuberculosis. Next is the dosing. For an average adult with normal renal function, that is creatinine clearance greater than 70 ml per minute, gentamicin, tobravicin, sisomycin and natamycin are given as 3 to 5 mg per kg per day and streptomycin, kenamycin and amikacin are given 7.5 to 15 mg per kg per day. Now we shall look on to the ADRs of aminoglycoside. The first and foremost ADR is autotoxicity. Autotoxicity consists of cochlear damage and vestibular damage. Cochlear damage means there is progressive hearing loss. So there is a retrograde degeneration of auditory nerve fibers which lead to permanent deafness. There will not be any regeneration, so the deafness is permanent. Initially, the patient may be asymptomatic to the toxicity. Then tinnitus occurs. Tinnitus means buzzing in the ear, which lead to progressive hearing loss. This stage, the patient may be to two to four weeks. Next, vestibular damage. In vestibular damage, patient shows headache, nausea, vomiting, nystagmus, ataxia, and vertigo. When the drug is stopped at this stage, the patient go on to the chronic phase. It lasts about six to 10 weeks. While this phase, the patient may be asymptomatic while lying down and may show symptoms afterwards, that is while awakening. The recovery that may be incomplete, it may take one to two years. And the amikacin and canamycin shows most the cochlear damage and streptomycin and gentamicin shows vestibular damage. Next is nephrotoxicity. This drug may also cause nephrotoxic effects. The tubular damage may lead to loss of urinary concentration power, low glomerular filtration rate, nitrogen retention, albuminuria and urinary gas. This is based on the dose of the drug and duration of treatment. Nephrotoxicity may be reversible up upon discontinuation and there is an important factor that is aminoglycoside induced nephrotoxicity may lead to enhanced autotoxicity. That is by when there is nephrotoxicity, the plasma concentration of the drug increases which lead to autotoxicity. Next is neuromuscular blockade. This drug may reduce the acetylcholine re release from the motor end plates and also decrease the sensitivity of muscle end plates to acetylcholine. So these are the main toxicities of the drug. First one is autotoxicity, then nephrotoxicity and neuromuscular blockade. Now we shall discuss about the contraindication and precautions. This drug is contraindicated in pregnancy as this may cause fetal autotoxicity. So we should avoid the use of this drug in pregnant women. We should also avoid concurrent use of other nephrotoxic drugs, which may have a synergistic effect on the toxic effect. Okay, for example of such drugs are NSAIDs, amphotericins, etc. There should be also cautious use with other autotoxic drugs such as vancomycin, fruzamide, etc. Cautious use is also to be done in elderly patients who are 60 years of age and more. We should also consider the patients who already have kidney damage or hearing loss, etc. So that's about aminoglycoside. Thank you.